We're in John chapter 15 this morning. John 15, 1 through 11. And we will talk about the necessity of abiding in Christ and remaining in him that we might bear much fruit in him. John 15, 1 through 11. This is an analogy. And the Bible is full of analogies. It's wonderful to teach the analogies of the Bible and things that we know, the known, comparing to the unknown, things that we do not know about, that we might come to know what is unknown through a comparison. And so what we have before us this morning is a comparison of a vine and a branch and fruit bearing. So would you please stand to honor the Lord as we read his word this morning. All right. John chapter 15 verses 1 through 11. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing." If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. Thanks, buddy. All right. In this passage this morning, we have a vine and branch analogy. We've all seen things growing, and we know what it means to have a branch and to have a trunk, or have a branch and have a vine. And in this passage, Jesus is the vine. And I want you to see that it's not the church, it's not a program, it's the person of Jesus Christ. And this is a very personal passage. It's a passage that speaks to us about drawing close to the person of Jesus Christ. Many people don't see their Christianity as a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you don't hear anything this morning, I want you to understand that us drawing near to Jesus in a way that was very similar to his disciples personally drawing near to him and spending time with him is the analogy that we ought to see of us personally drawing near to Jesus Christ and the beautiful things that come from being near to him. It says that the father is the vine dresser or the one who works the vine or the one who is at work forming the relationship between us. And it says that he is doing two things here. One, he is taking away branches that do not bear fruit and he is pruning branches that do bear fruit. We're going to hold the taking away part until uh, a little bit later when we talk about true and false faith. But here, those that are bearing fruit It says that he prunes them. Uh, Let's see here. Uh, Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit, which is exactly what pruning is all about. If you've ever uh, worked in a garden or even grown tomato vines, you understand what it means to pick off the suckers and prune back the things that, that are extra and are unnecessary. The point of pruning is to focus the energy of the plant towards fruit bearing or being all that it can be. Cutting off the extra parts of a shrub helps it to grow more dense and look like it ought to. But in a fruit bearing tree, much of the the nutrition and the energy of the plant can go into growing parts and pieces of it that don't produce any fruit. So good gardeners understand what it means to actively cut off the excess or the weak or the dead branches so that it can bear more fruit. The the energy of the plant is focused on bearing fruit. And so the analogy is used of God the Father working in our lives, 
actively pruning us, actively working in our lives to cut away excess, to take away those things that are unhelpful for bearing fruit for Christ Jesus. Because if you haven't understood yet, the purpose of the Christian life is to bring glory to God our Father. And as we'll see in this passage, bearing fruit and going out and living for Christ Jesus in a way that people see the work of God in your life brings glory to God. And so God the Father is actively at work in the life of every Christian to cut away excess and cut away things that will be a distraction to you bearing fruit in your life for his glory. And so we should not be surprised when these things happen. And we should understand that they are for our good and for the purpose of focusing our lives on bearing fruit for the glory of God the Father in our lives. And so we can grasp this analogy. The the analogy that if a branch is separated from the vine, it will surely die. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, go home today and clip a branch off a tree and lay it in the middle of your yard this week and see what it looks like next week when you come back. It'll be a shriveled up dead mess. And the point is that the same thing is for you. If you walk out of here today and have no contact with Jesus until next week, your life will be a shriveled up mess by the time you get back here next week. You will be a vine, a branch detached from Christ Jesus, and there will be weakness in your life because of it. But he goes on and connects the word abide and abiding with this idea of remaining near Christ Jesus. The word abide and the theme of abiding is a powerful and enduring theme in the writings of uh, the Apostle John. If we go to the first letter of John, in that short letter, he uses the word abide 16 times. He over and over and over is giving us different ways to understand what it means to abide, which is to intentionally and continually remain near Jesus intentionally and continually remain near Jesus. This is what it means to abide near Christ. And it says here that it is a mutual abiding. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. So us seeking to be near Christ and then Christ himself coming near to us, a mutual abiding. I believe that this understanding points to what we see in verse 14 and 15, which we will not get today, but is a beautiful uh, understanding of our relationship. It says in verse 14 that we are called friends, no longer slaves, no longer servants, but we are called friends in coming near to Christ Jesus. And we understand what it means to have friendship. Friendship is when we want to be near somebody and they want to be near us. It's not friendship if you want to be near someone and they don't want to have anything to do with you. Or they want to be near you, but you don't want to be near them. Friendship is when the two of you want to be near each other and the being together is something of mutual blessing. And so in abiding with Christ, we are seeking to be near him and he also wants to be near us. And so it is a friendship, a thing that produces joy. But we would immediately think of a friendship with Jesus as like a friendship with someone that is of the utmost importance. If you've ever tried to build a friendship with someone that is in a high position of authority, it's always a difficult thing. Because though you may want to be near them, and perhaps they also want to be near you, they're so busy and it's so difficult to, to, to be together and to spend meaningful time together because of access. And I want you to see this morning that Jesus is inviting so many passages in the scripture that speak to us being invited into the presence of God, that his inviting and his welcoming are equal. And that when we respond to the inviting and the drawing of Christ Jesus, there will always be access to him. This is part of his omnipresence. The, the good and wonderful attribute of God that he is always present and always able to be with us. He is not like a person of this world that only has 24 hours a day and can only have one conversation at a time and cannot possibly spend meaningful time with everyone. Christ Jesus, his door is always open and his ear is always open to your words and his presence by his spirit will always abide with your heart. And as you seek to abide with him, he will abide with you. Christ is always seeking after his church. Just one chapter before this in John 14, 
he spoke these incredible words about wanting us to be where he is. This is the ultimate of this, that not only now, but Christ Jesus has gone to prepare a place for all those who are in Christ, that where I am, there you may be also. And that's incredible. I want to read a a brief passage to you from a sermon uh, by Jonathan Edwards about this. It says, when Christ was going to heaven, he comforted his disciples with the thought that after a while he would come again and take them to himself, that they might be with him. And we are not supposed that when the disciples got to heaven, they found him keeping a greater distance than he used to. No, doubtless he embraced them as friends and welcomed them to his and their father's house and to his glory and their glory. They who had been his friends in this world, who had been together with him here and had had together partaken of sorrows and troubles, are now welcomed by him to rest and to partake of glory with him. He took them and led them into his chambers and showed them all his glory. And as he prayed in John 17, 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me, that they may behold the glory which thou hast given me. And so it's a picture of the disciples knowing Christ and spending time with him now, but then entering into his glory and being welcomed even further into his presence through abiding sin being done away with in our life and us being glorified in Christ. And so I want to get you, I want you to have some picture, some understanding of what it means that abiding near Christ is not just having knowledge about God. It is a personal nearness unto Jesus Christ where we seek his nearness and he comes near to us. And there is this great sense of friendship between us and God because there is peace now between us and God because of the salvation and forgiveness of sins that we have in his name. And so the question that's put before us by this passage and the challenge of this passage is are we intentionally and continually seeking relational nearness with Jesus Christ? If you understand Christianity to be you praying a prayer and confessing your sins and then putting that on the shelf as like an insurance policy and then going about living your life, you have completely missed what is happening in the Christian life. The Lord Jesus would have us to come to him in the confession of sins and our initial faith, but that our faith and our relationship with the Lord Jesus would grow and grow and grow and grow continually throughout our life, bringing us closer and closer to the Lord and more and more fruit of his spirit being born in our life, that the world might see the work of God in our life and give glory to the Father, and that our being would be completely transformed by the work of God in our life, taking us from from what we used to be to something totally different and more beautiful than we ever thought that we could be on our own. So our sinful nature is absolutely bent towards self-sufficiency. Our sinful nature is bent towards a love of the world. Our sinful nature is bent towards material needs absolutely distracting us from spiritual needs. And every single one of us in here know what that means in your life or in your context. And Jesus always commands us towards our weakness. And so he says these things to us because people have always struggled in remaining near to the Lord. There's always distraction, always necessity, always struggle that would take us away from being near to the Lord. And so abiding is what we are called to do and what we are commanded to do. It is primarily speaking to our personal spiritual discipline, I believe, before the Lord. All personal relationships require the three things to, to, to thrive. All personal relationships require commitment, sacrifice, and intentionality. And I believe our relationship with the Lord also requires commitment, sacrifice, and an intentionality to it. If we have not committed ourselves to the Lord Jesus, we will wander away into other things. We must always say yes to people in some way, and when we say yes to them, we say no to others. And so committing ourselves to the following after Christ Jesus is to say yes to the Lord Jesus in the first place. He will not have second place in your life. We are called from long ago to put no other gods before me, that nothing can have the first place in the affections of our heart or the passions of our life above Christ Jesus our Lord. And if we ask ourselves honestly today, we know that there are things in our lives that are, we are committed to far and above Christ Jesus, then there is a problem in your spiritual life. 
For we must be willing and ready to say yes to Christ Jesus and putting away other things that he might always have the first place in our life. This is going to involve sacrifice. Every personal relationship that you have in your life that is important to you, when you think of the relationship that you have with your spouse or your children or your nearest friends, there is always something that must be sacrificed, something that we must give up in order to maintain and retain that friendship or that relationship. And so it is with Christ that we must sacrifice time in other areas. We must give up passions in our heart of other things. We must have resources that are given up or used for the purpose of seeking after Christ, whereas they could be used in other ways. But to abide with him, we sacrifice other things that we might be near Christ. And all of this points towards intentionality. The idea that the thoughts of your mind and the affections of your heart are aimed towards something primarily. For some of you, it is your work. For some of you, it is your hobbies. For some of you, it is athletics. For some of you, it is your children. Through some of you, I don't know what it may be, your academics. But your heart passion is focused on those things. But for those of us in Christ, the primary intentional focus of our life must be seeking after Christ. And under him, all the things of our life will begin to be ordered in a way that are good and beautiful and work out and make sense and bring strength and life to what is happening. And so I believe that abiding in Christ revolves around commitment and sacrifice and intentionality. But those things take shape in the basic spiritual disciplines of the Christian life. And we could talk about this for a very long time. But the Christian life is not a haphazard life. Part of the intentionality of the Christian life is that there is discipline to the Christian life. Certain things that we do intentionally. And doing those things intentionally bears fruit. And doing those things continually and intentionally brings us near and keeps us near to Christ Jesus. I would offer to you four basic spiritual disciplines today. Then when we look at what does it mean for me, Pastor, to abide near Christ Jesus, that if you will intentionally and in a committed way seek after these things, they will keep you near to Christ Jesus. The first is Bible study and being in God's Word. If you close God's Word, you will never have a near relationship to Jesus Christ. You will always lose your way in your own mind and in your own thinking. You will will end up making a God of your own imagination because you will lose sight of who Christ Jesus is. This is daily Bible reading, actual Bible reading. I encourage you to have a plan. On our website we have Bible reading plans that you might over time read through all of God's Word. I know that many of you have never read all the way through the Bible And it is important that if we're going to call ourselves Christians, that we take time to read all the way through God's word. And in meeting with the Lord, in reading God's word, we will be meeting together with Jesus. It's like the apostles coming and sitting at his feet to hear him as a rabbi, as a teacher, to instruct their hearts. And when we open God's word, it's like us sitting at his feet that we might hear from him and be instructed in our souls. The second discipline of abiding near Christ is prayer. All throughout the disciples' time with Christ, they were always going back and forth from teaching to prayer, teaching to prayer. We must be a people of prayer, a people where prayer is a ready and everyday part of our lives, where we hear from the Lord Jesus from his word, and then we offer ourselves to him in prayer. And we should not forget the basics of the pattern of the Lord's prayer. The disciples said, Jesus teach us how to pray. And he said, pray like this. And he gave our Father who art in heaven, which is glory, which is giving glory to the Lord Jesus, making much of him in your prayers. That your kingdom come and your will be done. This is submitting ourselves to the Lord, submitting ourselves to his authority. Give us this day our daily bread, presenting our needs to the Lord Jesus. Lord God, I have this need that is just crushing me. I need this today and presenting our needs to the Lord. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, confessing our sins to the Lord Jesus on a regular basis, keeping short accounts with God that your fellowship with God might not be hindered by your sins. And lastly, deliver us from temptation and evil. 
praying against evil in our lives, praying for protection from evil things in our lives, and praying for protection over our, those of us that are in our family and our friends. This is a pattern of prayer. It's not that we repeat these words in a mindless way, but we follow this pattern so that prayer becomes a regular and normal part of our life, and it guides us in how we ought to pray. If you take the Lord's Prayer for granted, go to other countries and other places and see what people pray about and how they pray and see how radically misguided people can be in the way that they try to approach God when they close the Bible and leave the Lord's Prayer behind. And things end up getting very perverted and out of sorts. And so let us see the Lord's Prayer as a pattern for spiritual discipline and abiding near Christ. Third, our abiding near Christ will always involve us coming to the church, which does not mean this building. It means coming to the gathering of God's people, coming to gather together with other Christian people. We absolutely need other Christian people. If we isolate ourselves, we will also become discouraged and misguided, and we will not have the strength that we need from other Christian people to walk in the Christian life. And this is a danger in our day and age with online things, that you can think that you have been to church. It's good to hear teaching, but you have not actually been with anybody. You've been sitting in your car by yourself or sitting at your computer by yourself, and it's not like coming into this place and having another brother and sister pray for you and shake your hand and then pray for you, encourage you, as the scriptures say, encouraging one another on towards love and towards good deeds. And so we need each other in the church setting, both large and small. We've just had a recent push for small groups. I encourage you, if you've not found your place in a small group, find a small group that not only may you be in this large group setting, but during the week, find a smaller setting to meet with other Christians that will know your name, that will pray for you personally, encourage you that you might study God's word together. So Bible study, prayer, the meeting of the church, and also acts of joyful obedience. As we see in this passage, and John mentions over and over and over in his gospel and in his letters. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. It is impossible to say that you are abiding in Christ and following after him if you do not obey his commands. And so after we have come to his word, and after we have been in prayer, and after we have been together with other believers, we must go out to obedience, to follow after and live for the Lord God. And it will, it will bear a, a fruit of joy in our life because we know that we are seeking to live in harmony with Christ Jesus our Lord and not counter to his ways. And as we live according to his will in this world, he will fill us with his spirit, giving us strength to obey him. And when we go out into the world and we live in a different way from the world, it sets us apart as we live for Christ Jesus. And I have never known a person that in in an authentic way was studying the scriptures, praying, being involved with the church, and seeking to obey the Lord that did not draw near to him. These are the ways of abiding. If you would be near Christ, follow in these ways. And you will find that nearness to Christ Jesus, as you seek to abide in him, He will abide in you. As you strive in these ways, God's Spirit will fill you up and strengthen you to be able to accomplish what is in your heart and to change you as you seek to accomplish it. So the summary verse is verse 5. It brings these things together. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So if you strive after these things, to abide in Christ and be near him, the Lord Jesus will bear much fruit in your life. Things will begin to change. You will see a dramatic difference in your life. Because I tell you, it is impossible to come to authentic salvation in Christ Jesus, to be indwelled by his spirit, to seek after him, and to not have your life be dramatically changed. Those that say, well, I'm not really sure I'm in Christ. And it's really, I'm really not a whole lot different than I was before, but I've enjoyed this Christianity thing. They do not know what it means to abide in Christ and have their life truly and earnestly transformed to bear much fruit. Because the Lord does not come into the heart of a person and draw them to himself and do the work that he does that they might bear little fruit and languish on the sidelines. 
When we come into Christ, we are dramatically changed and our life becomes different. And as we bear fruit in him, people don't see our own work. They say, something has happened to you. What has happened to you? You're a dramatically different person than you used to be. And it's something not of you. There's something else going on with you. I can't put my finger on it. And we get a chance to speak about Christ. And we must see the other side of this is that if we are not abiding with Christ, we are not near to this vine, we will bear no fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Not that you can do a little bit, and I will help you, which is the message of Mormonism and the message of Roman Catholicism and the message of so many false religions, that you do all that you can do and then God will help you out a little bit in the end. That is not the message of Christ. It is that apart from me, you can do nothing. So if you separate yourself from Christ Jesus, the work of the Lord will not be a part of your life. This is speaking to the cooperation of sanctification in our life. As we come to Christ Jesus, those who are in Christ Jesus seek to abide near him and they are strengthened to accomplish these things. And so let's see about this remaining near Christ and this bearing much fruit before we go back to the no fruit part. Because verse 8 says, This is my Father, this, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. God is not interested in a little bit of glory for himself, but a great amount of glory for himself. That as we live for him and bear fruit in him, that he is greatly glorified in the world by people seeing that there is a God and that his spirit is at work in the world. And so the fruits of the spirit are clearly uh, mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Love and joy and peace and patience Kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And so as we seek to follow after Christ and abide near him and God's work, God's spirit is at work in our heart, we begin to change. And these things become evident in our lives. And those of us that have lived for any period of time know that we are not naturally loving and gentle and kind people. We do not naturally live lives of self-control and peace and patience. It is only when the Spirit of God is at work in our hearts that we begin to live in such a way and that we can say that our lives are truly characterized by these things and we might go walk in these ways and that those ways might increase in our life so that the world sees that the Holy Spirit of God is at work in our life. And in bearing much fruit, we bring glory to God. And there is a, a, a congruity, there's a, 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 an agreement in our life from the words that we say and the actions that we live. That we say we love the Lord Jesus and we go out and we live in a way that shows that we love the Lord Jesus. That we say we honor the Lord and we actually live a self-controlled life. We are patient people. We are joyful people in the obedience that we live out in Christ Jesus. And there is an agreement here. But the Bible is very clear, and this gets to some of the, some of the parts in verse 2 and verse 6 as to what is going on here with these branches that are being taken away, these branches that are being thrown in the fire. If anyone does not abide in me, uh, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. I do not believe at all that this speaks of the loss of salvation. I do not believe that the work of God can be quenched in a person's life. That the, when the Lord brings us to himself and we are born again, we are given new life in Christ, that he is both the author and the perfecter of our salvation, the scriptures say, that what he begins, he will complete. But we also are given many indications in scripture as to people that speak words that come from knowledge from the mind that have not affected their heart at all. And their words are false because they are not coming from a heart that has been transformed. There is no abiding with Christ. There is separation from him. The ultimate character of this in the scriptures is Judas Iscariot. 
Uh, If you've never heard a sermon on Judas, you can go and look it up in our archive. He's the ultimate biblical example of the person that said the right things and had much knowledge of God and fooled everybody. But in his heart, he never believed in Christ Jesus. In his heart, nothing had ever happened there. And so it was a false game until eventually that falseness broke forth into the open and everyone was able to see his love of money rather than his love of the Lord. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 26 is a passage that has difficult parts to it, but the overall thrust of it is very clear. It asks a question, what good is it that you, if you listen to someone who has words of faith, but their life does not demonstrate the reality of their faith? And this disconnectedness between someone that speaks things about God, but their life is full of wickedness and anger, and they're out of control, and there's all kinds of things going on here that are not a part of Christ Jesus. And a part of that passage is that we have the right to question such people, to say, brother or sister, are you really in Christ? Has your heart really been changed? Because what you're saying and what you're doing are radically out of step with each other. This is somewhat of what the parable of the weed and the tares speaks about. That we are never able in the church to fully define who is and who is not in Christ. I cannot see into your heart. I can hear your words, I can see your actions, and I can see the fruit of the actions of your life, and I can have great confidence in so many of you that there is an agreement between your words and your actions which demonstrates the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. But I also cannot look into your soul and know whether as you listen to me today that you, whether you believe these things or whether you don't. It is only ultimately between you and God as to whether you know that you believe these things or you do not believe these things. And so there, is, there will be in the last day a separation of those that have believed and those who have not believed, those who have trusted in Christ that the Lord Jesus has drawn into himself and have continued to make progress in the faith through abiding with Christ and those that have never believed and those whose words were empty and were false and their hearts were never with the Lord. They had knowledge of Christ but no belief in their hearts. And so as we close, I want to ask you two questions. Are you abiding in Christ? Those of you that know you have come to salvation, you know Christ Jesus as your Lord. You have repented of your sins and you believe in him. But you struggle, as I struggle, as we all do, as to remaining near with him. I want you to hear these words this morning and I want to encourage you to press on to continually and intentionally draw near to Christ Jesus. For if you will abide in him, he will abide with you. If you seek him this week, and you set your alarm a little earlier in the morning or break out a part of your schedule to make sure that you spend time with Christ and you open your scriptures in a heart of prayerfulness and seek him, he will also draw near to you. And it will be a special time that will renew your heart and strengthen you. And I encourage you to do this every day, that you might abide with Christ and that his spirit might bear great fruit in your life a fruit that glorifies the Lord as people see authentic Christianity in your life. Those of you that this week might know that you have never put your faith in Christ Jesus, that you have been following a form of religion, you've been doing things for God, or you know that you ought to say certain things about God to please certain people in your life, but you know for a fact that you've never believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that you've never gotten down on your knees and confessed your sins before God because you love the sin of your life, and you want to keep doing the things that you're doing because you love this world, that today you might confess your sins and put your faith in Christ Jesus, that you might come to salvation, that you might seek Christ, seeing him as this vine, this true vine, that without him there will be no spiritual life in your life. Seek him today, that you might know him as your Savior, and you will find him gracious and merciful and kind, and that he will come alongside you and forgive your sins, that he might take you to where he is. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time together this morning. Thank you for this beautiful passage of Scripture, and I pray that it would be an encouragement for those in Christ, and that it would be something that presses those that don't know you, that they might see their necessity of believing in you today, and that they would not despise the grace of Jesus Christ, but that they would believe in you today. Lord, we thank you that you are a gracious friend to us, 
And that as we seek after you, Lord, you will seek after us. And as we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. I pray, Lord, that this week that we would intentionally and continually seek after you and the beautiful personal relationship that Christianity is. I pray that as we seek after you this week, that you would strengthen what is weak, that you would build up what has been torn down, that your Holy Spirit would fill our hearts with love for you and love for one another and a love for our lost friends and neighbors, that you would help us to live patient lives, that you would help us to be filled with self-control, that we might stay away from those things that are sinful and wicked, that we might break the bonds of addiction, and that we might come out of times of depression. And Lord, that you would be near to us in all of these things. We love you. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.